This is Pat with Pat's Two Cents. We are God's Church of Love every Saturday at 1215 Pacific. Listen, God wants you to understand the power of wisdom. He wants you to understand what it means to be able to receive correction, receive instruction, receive suggestions, receive words of wisdom, of understanding, get deeper depths of understanding and insight. And we get to learn how to navigate through life so much easier when we really get what's going on. When we don't know what's going on, it's like groping through the darkness. You aim and you miss. You say and you lose out. You don't understand why things are falling through holes in your life. Because sometimes it's a lack of wisdom. Sometimes it's a lack of determination. Sometimes it's a lack of knowledge. What does God say? My people perish for lack of knowledge. So what we're doing is trying to get all the knowledge all the wisdom, all the understanding we can, because it really does make life so much easier. All right, so we are going right now to Romans chapter, not Romans, I take that back. We are going to Proverbs chapter three. I want you to go with me to Proverbs chapter three. Very practical message today. All right, my son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck, write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. Let me repeat that in in the words of Pat's two cents. In everything you do everything you plan, everything you wonder about, everything you have to do business in, personally or professionally, or ministerially for that matter. Acknowledge God in all those ways. Acknowledge God in every decision you make, and he shall direct thy path. He may tell you not to leave your house, for two hours, when you want to get everything done before four o'clock in the afternoon, God may tell you, stay in my presence for two hours, read my word, play worship music, think on the things I've done in your life. If you don't have much to say, listen. And then at three o'clock or 4.30 or five, leave the house. And you're wondering, well, how am I going to get everything done? Trust me, God knows how to slow time down and speed you up. He knows how to make up for what you consider lost time. But the bottom line is, whatever you do will be right on time because you're right in the center of God's will. And God knows how to put things together in a way that you could never, with all your intelligence, all the the skilled uh, wisdom and all the skilled knowledge you have in your little pea brain, you could never make your day line up like God can when you put it in his hands completely. All right. So you find yourself accomplishing way more with way little because you put it in God's hands. All right. Moving right along. Let's go to the next one. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Now, that's a deep one right there, because many of us are. Many of us think we got a handle on everything we do. We think we're successful because of what we did. We think we we make good money because of what we did. We think we're really healthy because of what we did. We think that we, I mean, everything that's working in our favor is because of what I did down through the years. I did this and I did that. No, 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 no. You forget. All God has to do is inhale, lift his favor, 
or lift his Holy Spirit a half an inch off of the top of your head and you fall flat on your face at every turn. You have to remember to give that glory to God because number one, he gave you the ability to get wealth. He gave you the brains you've got that learns quickly. He gave you that level of understanding and insight that you have above your fellows. He gave you that joy that keeps you floating when life would want to sink you down and drown you. He gave you that inner strength and fortitude. He gave you whatever it is that enables you to succeed. God gave it to you. I want that to sink in for a second. Let's move on. Seven, be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. Right here. Thank you, Lord. This is what came to my mind this morning and last night. And it's going to involve me and Lynn. Lynn and I are about the same age. She's about, about four, five, six months older than I am. I'm the youngest and the prettiest. <laughs> well, she looks younger and I hate her for it. All right, listen to this, y'all. Lynn and I both write. Now, God is using Lynn as a scribe. And Lynn has been writing. As you heard what she wrote today, that came from God. She gets those. She's got hundreds of those. Hundreds. All right. Over 500, if I'm not mistaken. Probably pushing a thousand by now. And listen, what I want you to hear is what happens between me and Lynn. What has gone on during the last year? And I'm saying it for a point. I want you to catch this. A lot of you have a very difficult time taking correction, getting suggestions getting words of adjustment, whatever. You have a hard time doing it. I deal with people, I've dealt with people for the last three years where I've seen more of it than not, especially in seasoned saints who have been saved for 30 and 40 years, have a very difficult time receiving words of correction. Now, Lynn and I, this is the example the Lord gave me to use. Lynn and I both write. When I wrote my book, you should see the markups Lynn had when she went through it, asking questions, clarify this, this is a this, or this is a that, or maybe you use a different word to be clearer. I mean, marked up from top to bottom. Now, the one thing she never heard me say or ask her is, what's the matter? You think I'm stupid or something? You think I don't know that? I've been going to school probably longer than you. Did she hear me say that? No. On the other hand, Lynn sends me things when she writes up something and she wants to upload it onto a site. You know, you know, I want to make sure it's it's doctrinally correct. I want to make sure if you see any errors, if you see anything that doesn't have the right backing or it, does, it doesn't ring right according to God's word or it doesn't ring right in a sentence, whatever, you know, catch it for me so I can make the adjustment. And when I do, and I write this or I write that suggestion, or maybe you could do that with this one, or maybe you could condense this and make the, the thought a little shorter. I've even done it with Cecilia Walker. We've gone over a, 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 a letter she was writing. It was, and she she wrote it to someone, and she wanted me to go over it. And and I was I was scratching this and deleting that, and telling her maybe you could reword the other. At that point, I had never had a degree. She did. So my point is, 
Not one of us has ever come back. Lynn never came back and said, what, you think you're smarter than I am? What, you think I'm too dumb to know the difference between this and that? Never got offended. I never got offended with her. She never got offended with me. Cecilia never got offended. She was blown away by the correction and loved all the adjustments and said it's so much better now. She was not offended. Why? Because our pride was not on the table. Pride is what will short circuit you. When God sends people in your lives, when God sends you help for your business, when God sends you help to teach you a higher level of doing your business, of handling life, of getting counsel, whatever the case is, and you think because you lived over 50 years that you know it all. You've done this and you've done that and you go through your litany of, I did five years of this and 15 years of that and I helped that one get their business going and I helped this one go to school and I helped that one grow up, whatever your case is. Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought because what ends up happening, this is a caution for all born again Christians. What ends up happening is you shut down the flow that God has sent your way to help you do a better job, to help you do your best. And you end up with a mess because you didn't want to hear it. You end up in a mess because you're offended by the words of correction. You're offended by the suggestions. You're offended by people trying to help you learn a different level of doing this or a different level of doing that. I can't tell you how many times I called Rashad and said, Rashad, What's a better way of doing this? I uh, This happens when I do that with the video. And he would tell me, do a lower resolution and it'll go up faster. Oh, I didn't know that, but he did. So guess what I did? I did what he said to do. I wasn't offended because he told me to do it. I asked him. He gave me the suggestion and I followed with it. Now, when you get to the point where you don't want to hear what other people have to say, you're in a very dangerous position because God will use people to help you improve your life. God will use other people to say things, to do things, to suggest things that will help your life become easier, that will help you reach a higher level of whatever goal you're trying to reach. Speaking of reaching goals, I reached this goal by getting my doctorate and writing and publishing my book. It's a commentary, a dramatized commentary on the book of Revelation to help those understand what is really going on in our day and time during these last days. Back to the message. God wants you to look good, not look bad. So when he puts people in your life that knows more than you do about this over here or that over there, Understand that when a person is helping you, they may know more than you about A, B, C, but trust me, you know more than they do about C, D, and E. So you have to understand that it's not about one person being better, lesser, looking down, looking up. No, we're all helping each other. If you picture, I'm getting this picture right now, a circle of 10 or 12 people, arm in arm, arm in arm, listen to this, and they're all on the ground, they're going to have to, if one person is able, has the strength to get up without the use of their arms and the strength of their legs alone. Once they're up, they can start to help the people on each side rise up as well. And as those people rise up, you have a wave of people rising from the ground to their feet because the circle has reinforced itself. It doesn't mean that one is weaker. It means that the one with the most strength gets to do the job, gets to get the, uh, the situation started. They get the ball rolling. Everybody wants to rise. 
But the best way you're going to do it is together with each other's help. I know with me, I probably take about four or five people to help me get up off the ground. Unless the two people on my side are really, really strong. Or they might have to pull in a crane. <laughs> but the bottom line is, we do what we have to do to help each other rise to that next level. The next level of maturity. The next level of skill. The next level of business savvy. The next level of discipline. The next level of education. Whatever your level is, you have to be willing to receive. What does the Bible say? Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. He, If you humble yourself, he will exalt you. If you exalt yourself, he will humble you. Sometimes the humbling experience is a pruning process. God is chipping away at stuff that doesn't need to be there anymore. He's doing that. And we don't like the pruning process. It's all about growth because you have to understand we're living in the last days. You are so crucial to God's plan. Each one of us is if we lend ourselves to his service, if we avail ourselves to him. There are going to be times when you're going to have your feathers ruffled. That's part of growing in the Lord. There are going to be times when you're going to have your feelings hurt. That's part of maturing in the ways of God. There are going to be times when you're going to feel downright stupid. That's part of God raising your mindset so that you can do more with your mind. Your mind can grow. You can grasp more things. But if you don't want to hear it, if you don't want to do what it takes, it's not on everybody else. It's on you. If you feel like people are sabotaging you when they give you a suggestion, people are criticizing you when they give you a word of correction, you got to go to God and say, Lord, you got to ask, is my pride in the way here? Because I notice down through 10, 20, 30 years, every time people come up and they have all these suggestions, I think they're trying to sabotage me. I think it's a conspiracy. It feels like they're attacking me. That might not be the case, y'all. That might be God. You hear me? That might be God trying to make you the best you that you could possibly be. But if you are not willing to hear it, if you are not willing to receive it, you are literally fighting against God himself. Do you hear me? That's why you have to have a spirit of humility because what is it? A haughty heart? comes before fall and pride before destruction, whichever way, whichever order that goes. Fall and then the destruction. You got haughtiness, you got pride. That's the thing that will undo you, not the people that have been trying to help you. They're not the ones trying to stab you in the back. Your own pride is doing that. All right. So let's move on. That's enough of Pat's two cents on that one. So seven, be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. And evil includes pride. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance. We already read that. Okay. Um, Ten, so shall thy bonds be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. We went through that. 12, for whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father, the son, in whom he delighteth. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. You know that scripture that says, 
you know, when you get wisdom with all that wisdom, make sure you get understanding too. I'm putting it in everyday terms. 14, for the merchandise of it, the merchandise of wisdom and understanding, that's what it's referring to, is better than the merchandise of silver and the gain thereof than fine gold. She, that's wisdom and understanding, is more precious than rubies and all the things thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. Length of days is in her right hand and in her left hand, riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her and happy is everyone that retaineth her. The Lord, by wisdom, hath founded the earth. By understanding, hath he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the depths are broken up and the clouds drop down the dew. My son, let not them depart from thine eyes. Don't let that happen. Don't let that uh, be far from you. Knowledge, wisdom, understanding. You don't want that to leave you. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. So shall they be life unto thy soul and grace to thy neck. Then shalt thou walk in thy way safely and thy foot shall not stumble. Wow. All right. When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down and thy sleep shall be sweet. Be thou, be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of desolation of the wicked when it cometh. For the Lord shall be thy confidence and shall keep thy foot from being taken. Withhold not good from them to whom it is due, when it is in thy power of thine hand to do it. Say not unto thy neighbor, go and come again, and tomorrow I will give when thou hast it by thee. Devise not evil against thy neighbor, seeing he dwelleth securely by thee. Strive not with a man without cause, if he have done thee no harm. Some of you strive with people because they're trying to help you. Mm -hmm. I remember I was talking to a guy years ago. It was a guy that I dated and I realized, oh, this relationship ain't going nowhere. I wasn't saved, but I could see it. I was trying to explain to him if he did a little bit of this or he did a little bit of that, it might make life more easy on him. He thought I was acting like a know-it-all and I was calling him stupid. Uh, that wasn't anywhere in my mind. I was trying to help. So here's another one. Uh, my first boyfriend, when I was 18, I had gotten my license, my driver's license, and I was getting ready to make a right turn. Just to give you an example of what I mean. So just something that simple. I was getting ready to make a right turn. And he told me, he said, you make your right turn far enough from the curve where a motorcycle or a small car could fit between you and the curve. What that sets you up for is an accident. You need to move over. Now, he was about five years older than I was, and he had been driving for years. He said, when you make your right turn, you need to ease over closer to the curb so that even a bicycle could barely fit between you and the curb. And you will eliminate the possibility of somebody trying to cut in and squeeze on that on that right turn, try to pass on your right. When you make your right turn, get as close to the curb as possible and it'll eliminate those kind of accidents. And I, I was like, oh my God, thank you. Well, that I kept and I use to this day. But And I learned it even more when I drove for RTD. With the buses, they tell you to get as close to the curb as possible when you're going to make a right turn because bicyclists and all kind of, of, of vehicles try to squeeze in to get past the bus because they don't want to wait for their bus to make that turn. And a lot of accidents happen on the right if the bus driver is not close enough to the curb. And it is the bus driver's fault, even though the other person did something dumb 
it's still considered the bus driver's fault. So you have to use wisdom. You have to understand when even times when you make a mistake and fall flat on your face, sometimes God makes it a very memorable occasion. It may be quite embarrassing, but God does that at this point in your life or at this stage in your life or your development, because he knows if he doesn't allow that to happen right now, where hardly any damage is done, other than your pride being bruised. Later on, if he lets that thing continue without being checked, and sometimes being checked means getting a ticket, sometimes being checked means having a little minor accident, a fender bender, sometimes being checked means you failed something and everybody found out about it. Whatever it is, you're being checked. But later on down the line, if you're not checked here, you'll end up losing your business completely. You will end up failing in such a big way that it'll take you years to recover from your own disappointment in yourself. God's trying to avoid that from happening because he sees where you're headed. So he allows the little misdemeanors in your life to happen now, the misdemeanors to your pride to your ego, the misdemeanors to your pocket, the misdemeanors, the little things he allows to happen in a small level now, because later on, he knows if he doesn't keep that check now, it's going to blow up in your face and it'll be very difficult to recover from that at an older age. All right. So who God loves, he corrects. And that's what you got to remember. If I'm getting correction, I must be loved by God. You have to understand God is trying to make your life easier on you. His word says he goes ahead of you. He makes the crooked places straight. He makes the rough places plain. Plain means smooth. So what he's doing is he's going ahead of you. He's straightening out the messed up things in your life while he's smoothing out your rough edges. You hear me? So he's trying to make your path ahead of you a smoother ride. He's trying to make it a more enjoyable journey because he wants you to have life abundantly. He wants you to have joy unspeakable, full of glory. He wants you to be rich in peace, rich in wisdom, rich in understanding. That way you avoid so many pitfalls when you already know ahead of time. Oh, that's right. I remember the Lord showed me something like this. And you apply that little thing you experience on a very higher, on a much higher level, on a much bigger scale. And your success will be exponential because you're applying every little thing you've learned along the way. But you can't learn it if you're not listening. You can't learn it if you're not reading. You cannot learn it if you're not studying. You cannot learn it if you're not rehearsing it before the Lord. You have to glean from God on a daily basis all day long. Well, Lord, what's the wisest approach? What's the way to do this? Broaden my mind. Sometimes you got to ask God to broaden your mind, to, to, to enlarge the capacity of the brain you already have. Lord, I'm slow here. I'm limited there. I'm short-circuited over here, and I'm weak right there. I really need you. I ask the Lord a lot of times to give me a genius mentality because I know the areas where I feel like I am nothing more than a dum diddy dum dum and I need help. This thing bat needs help big time. And I'm telling you, there are times God will give me ideas. He will give me like even strategies of improving my credit rating. He showed me one day, I was, I was looking at one, I said, mm, that dropped about three points. How do I get it back up? And clear as day, take this, pay that credit card over there to the point where it's down below 20%. Pay this credit card and, and, and use this one over here 
you have a good 5% more to go and you'll still be under 10%. And by the time I got through shifting and moving things around, my credit went back over 800. And I was like, oh, strategy, Lord. I mean, God gives me ideas. Like one time I was driving my car in the rain and it started jerking. And I was like, oh God, what's wrong with my car? Park it, it's the catalytic converter. Catalytic converter, what's that? I've heard of it, but I didn't know what it was. Sure enough, three months later, after it had been sitting, I started that baby up, boom, right in time for a man to come by and buy it off of me. So God will make things easy on you. Oh, oh here's a crazy one. I'm giving you uh, experiences because sometimes people don't realize how, how detailed God is in the smallest in the smallest areas of your life. I was, uh, after my car had to be parked for about three months, the Lord let me know a month before that last day, uh, they are going to start sending letters and you're going to have to move your car. You need to sell it before the month is up or they will tow it away. How did I know that? It was a knowing. It wasn't said in words. It was a knowing. And that knowing stayed with me for like two weeks. And finally, I said, okay, Lord, would you send me a buyer? Would you supernaturally send me a buyer so I could benefit the finances from selling the car? And then hopefully later on, you'll bless me with another town car that runs even better. So what happens? A week and a half later, my husband's, my late husband's best friend came by to pick up an old battery charger he had lent us. And when he picked it up, his brother from Arizona was with him. He jumps out the car. Excuse me, are you ever planning on selling this car? I said, oh my God. I said, yes. I gave him a price. I gave him a low price because the car needed work. And he jumped on it. He said, Monday, I'm going to have Prentice come up. I'll have the money and he will take you to, to AAA and, and do all the paperwork and you can, you know, transfer title and he'll give you the money and we'll be done. He'll drive it to Arizona and then I'll drive him back home. And the car, I mean, they got work done on it in Pasadena before they took it to Arizona. But the bottom line is that car served that man well until he died never had a problem. And I had money that helped me out. So God will, <laughs> God will make ways to bless you. My friend Pat, God used her. She didn't know it, but every time I dreamt about a car, I got one. And now I, that I'm without a car, I dream that God, this is all coming from God, y'all. I dream that I'm driving a little, a little old, older car, an older model car. And I knew in the dream that it was given to me. And I'm like, Lord, thank you for this car. I'm finally independent again on the road. And what happens? A week later, Pat calls me and says, would you be offended if I offered you my old car? The Lord blessed me with a new car and they're only going to give me X amount of dollars in return. So I thought I could bless somebody who needed one. And you came to my mind. The Lord put you on my mind. And I said, yes, thank you. And that, I mean, it, she gave me a car, y'all. Do you get that? I'm not scrambling around, scratching and digging. What do I do? Where do I go? How do I get transportation? No, the Lord already let me know. I got you covered. Just wait on me. It'll happen. And it happened. It came to me. Your blessings will come on you and overtake you, according to Deuteronomy 28. My blessings were coming on me and overtaking me. The next dream, I'm waking up in a town car. I'm hollering at my niece. God gave me back my town car. I look at the license. It has a different number than the old car. So I knew it was a different car. What happens then? God uses Peter. He test drives the car and then offers to pay for it. I'm telling you, you don't understand when God is in charge, 
He will make life easier on you. I don't care what challenges are around you. God has your answer. But are you going to him or are you blaming him? Are you praising him and thanking him in advance? Or are you grumbling and complaining and mumbling and griping and angry and bitter? What is your attitude? Is it the attitude of gratitude? You have to ask God to give you the wisdom to understand what season you're in. Whatever you go through, like when I was going through the pain in my shoulders, I had to say, Lord, whatever, the bottom line is you've been good to me. You've never forsaken me. You are faithful. I don't know why this is going on, but if you just give me some scriptures, let me know you're going to heal me. I'm good with that. Even if I have to go through this for months, I'm good with knowing you're going to heal me. See, I remember the time when I had a lump in my breast and instead of fearing, I prayed. Instead of panicking, I interceded. I asked God to please intervene. Please heal. Please remove this thing, this lump. I don't want to go through the medical thing because doctors can make things worse. I want you to do this, Lord. So what happens? I go to a healing service to get prayer because I want God to do it. The man looks at me and says, didn't God promise you Psalms 91? That man didn't know me from Adam. He did not know that in my Bible, I wrote in April of 1993, Psalms 91, God's promise to me of good health and long life. He did not know I wrote that down. And I looked at him wide eyed and said, yes, he did. He said, go on over there and sit down. You already got your answer. Now, check it out. I still had that lump for a whole year and a half, but I was convinced at that moment that it would be gone one day and it would do me no harm. And one day after feeling every two or three months, I noticed after about a year and a half, that lump was gone. My question to you is where are you going to seek your wisdom? Where are you going to seek your skill set, your, 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 your intellect, your knowledge, your levels of understanding, the decisions you make? Who are you consulting with to get over? Because the only way you're going to really get over this life in this fallen world with fallen people in it and treachery all around is by God. He is your only source, baby. He is the only one that will get you over. God is the joy and the strength of my life. He removes all pain, misery, and strife. He promised to keep me, never to leave me. He's never, never fallen short of his word. You listen, y'all. You got to stay in his face. You got to stay in his face. He loves you with an everlasting love. He is love. He cannot help himself. But are you seeking him? Or are you seeking his hand? Are you seeking his presence? Or are you seeking him to give you presence? Which part are you seeking the most? Do you long for him? Do you long to feel him in your living room? Are you longing to feel that almighty green in the palm of your hand? Which is most important to you? Mm, which is your priority? Will you praise God if you're sleeping in the car? Would you praise God if your house got foreclosed on? Would you praise God? If it, it just seems like everything is going against you, would you still be talking to him? Would you still be praying to him? When I went through the darkest season of my life, I'm going to close soon, I promise. When I went through the darkest season of my life and the house was in foreclosure for way over a year and we hadn't made a payment, every time I turned around and my back was up against the wall. I'm sitting there with a pile of documents that have to be faxed in. And I had I had to interrupt all that because Milton had a crisis. So we had to run to 
the emergency. We're sitting in emergency with this pile of papers on my lap and the hospital, nobody, nobody in, at any desk will fax any of these forms for me. And I'm sitting there saying, Lord, if I don't get these in, they're going to move on with the foreclosure tomorrow. Help me. And what happens? My phone rings. It was like five minutes after I prayed that prayer with tears going down my face and worried about Milton and worried about losing the house. And what happens? Phone rings because in all my worry, I still knew who to call on. Phone rings as Leslie Greer, real estate broker. Hi, Pat. How you doing? Oh, girl, I'm in a quandary. I need to get these papers in. Oh, where are you? Huntington Hospital. I'm five minutes away. I'll be right there at the parking lot of the emergency entrance. Yeah. Come on out. Bring your documents and I'll take them home. I'm all, I live only three minutes away. Done. Problem solved. <laughs> I'm telling you, when you put everything in God's hands, when you acknowledge him in all your ways, no matter what your emotions feel like, you always have that steady stream of peace under your emotions. You feel it. You feel it. You know God's in charge. You know God's going to work it out. But you can't help but react emotionally sometimes. But even in your emotion, you're still doing the right thing. You're leaning on God, depending on God, praying to God, calling on God, asking God for help, for intervention. Because you're trusting him, not what you're feeling. You're trusting him above the circumstances. Amen. Okay, I got to cut this short because this is this sermon right here could go on another two hours. And we're not going to do that to you. So if God has me continue further next week, fine. If the job is done and I don't have to, then we'll have another subject next week according to God's plan. God bless you. Be encouraged. He knows how to get you from point A to point B. And if you get a chance, Read uh, 1 Kings chapter 5. I didn't get a chance to read that. It's where Solomon gets in touch with this guy, this king, and he asks him for his help. And he's humble enough to say, we don't have builders like what you have. You have the best. And we need to, I want to hire them through you. And that Solomon was wise enough to know where to go to get the best. Are you wise enough or are you going to do it your way no matter what? Because you know what you're doing. Bye, Cracky. I'm done. I just had to leave you with that question. God bless you. Mm -hmm.